My name is Dr. Timothy Scott Legler, and I do work at the Gavin Herbert Eye Institute of UC Irvine. I am extremely proud to work there. And I was a graduate of UCI a long time ago, back in 1978. So I have a special kinship and fondness for UCI in particular. Tonight's topic is the importance of annual eye exams and new lens technologies. I have no disclosures to report, but I would like to give a special thanks to Ken Lin and Janetta Parton at Extra Light Optical Labs and Sue Creek from the Chemistry Lens Division. So take a look at this image. And what kind of iconic story does this bring up to you? Most of you will probably identify this with one of those classic stories of 1928, I think it was, when Dorothy went on a little journey to try and find her way home. And she met three characters who helped her along the way. How could this story possibly help to explain the importance of annual eye exams and what we do here at Gavin Herbert Eye Institute? Well, let's find out. First, she did meet a cro uh, on her journey. She met a lion who was sadly a coward in search of courage. And for some of us, it takes courage to look for some of the weaknesses in your vision. So we expect to discover both the strengths and weaknesses in your vision and your eyes and general health when you come for an eye exam. Secondly, she did come across the scarecrow in search of brains. And we're gonna expect to learn as we teach you about your eyes and vision. So when you come for an eye exam, I want you to come excited, enthusiastic, and expect to learn about your eyes and vision. Finally, she did come across the Tin Man in search of a heart. And we use glasses, contact lenses, magnifiers, exercises, eye drops, medicines, compresses, lasers, surgery. We can prevent, heal, and at least compensate for some of the issues you have. So courage to discover, brains to teach, and a heart to treat and heal. And that is the mission statement of UCI Health in general, and specifically what we do on a daily basis at Gavin Herbert Eye Institute. We have all these specialists that I refer to every week. So when people have serious problems in any of these areas, that's where they go. And I'm familiar with all of them. I have to be because I'm kind of the entry point into the Gavin Herbert Eye Institute specialists. Now, I'm gonna show you four people and I want you to try and think of three things that they have in common. First one here. Second, third, that's Andrea Bocelli, and fourth, Helen Keller. So one thing they had in common, they were all extremely well accomplished in the worlds of music, writing and singing, and Helen Keller for, you might say, poetry and philosophy is an outstanding human being. So that's one thing they had in common. Another thing they had in common, they were all blind. And the third thing that they had in common, they all asked a question, no doubt, many times. And that is, what would it be like to see? What would it be like to have the gift of vision, to have clarity and acuity? to be able to see form and shapes and shading and texture, to actually see images. If, if you've never seen, what is it like to see? And that's a profound question that if you didn't have it, you would love to know what that would be like. 
So that gets to the heart of why it's important to have an annual eye exam. Because we want, all of us want to see, do, and be our best. And if you're not using your vision to its best potential, then you may be short-sighting short yourself a little bit and not being able to be your best. So we know that there's gonna be changes in your vision. It's expected. And some of those changes are normal and natural. And I'll be the one that will be able to tell you if they are. And some changes may be not so normal. They may be a yellow or red flag that something serious is going on. They could be a life-threatening uh, marker that we need to pay attention to right away. So the changes in your vision are something that have to be addressed and looked at. And I feel like that's a good place to have an annual eye exam is to look at those things. Your vision really can be summarized as the sum of, of two factors nature and nurture. By nature, I mean, this is what you're born with. This is the DNA from your parents, the blueprints for your eyes. And there can be genetic eye diseases that you have, and that's part of nature too. The other part is nurture. And by that, I mean how you use them, how you abuse them trauma and injury and disease like bacteria, viruses, and uh, those kinds of things. So nature and nurture are what determine what your vision is really all about. And I can help dis discern between the two and, and make sure that we, we monitor and watch for, for things. Now, what are some of the common complaints that I see at eye exams? Well, probably the most common one people come in for is blurry or fuzzy vision. And we have all kinds of ways of helping you out with that, with lenses for glasses and contact lenses, magnifiers, special bifocals and various things. But that's probably the number one reason people come in for routine eye exams to try and maximize their, their clarity of their vision. Even though we've passed Halloween, ghost images, halos and glare are another thing that people come in complaining of. And so that object in the middle with the, uh, the moon, that's a ghost image. And over to the far right is what we commonly call halos and glare. Those items are usually caused by cataracts and astigmatism. Cataracts, as you all know are when the lens inside of your eye becomes cloudy and cataracts start virtually the day you're born. They're, I tell people they're like wrinkles. They come on one day at a time. And it's such a slow, slow process that we just don't notice it. Typically people need cataract surgery about age 80. That's typical. But there are cataracts that occur, can occur overnight. If you got hit in the eye, you could have a cataract by the next morning and certain drugs and medications and diseases can cause cataracts too. But if you come in for your annual eye exam, I can easily, any optometrist can easily tell you whether your cataracts are normal or something to work or what type of cataract you've got going on. Astigmatism, we can easily test for and check. And I'll go over what that is in a few more minutes. Double vision. This is another problem that some people come in with. If you have a recently acquired double vision, that can be something serious. So we need to look into that pronto. If you have a tendency for double vision on and off once in a while, and you've had it for years and years, it's maybe something you don't have to live with. Come in, let us check and see if some prism in your glasses or eye exercises can help to alleviate that. The, the technical term for double vision is diplopia. 
And usually the causes for diplopia are listed over on the right. Esotropia is when your eyes cross. Exotropia is when your eyes go out. Hyper is one eye going up. Hypo is one eye going down. But you know, to kind of put it real simply, if your headlights aren't pointing straight, you're gonna start seeing double or your brain is gonna to need to suppress one of the two eyes. Distorted vision. And that's something that can happen to any of us at any time. It's usually due to something occurring on the very back of the eye on the retina. We use this test that I've got on your, on your screen there with the uh, squares. The one towards the middle is what you would stare at. That's called an Amsler grid. And when you stare directly at that with one eye at a time, looking at the black dot, it should look like a big square with no waviness to it at all. And then on the lower right, you'll notice that when you stare at that black dot, you might see what looks like a raised, blurry, wavy area. That indicates that there's an area on the back of your eye, near your macula, on the retina, that's raised, ripped, distorted, swollen, or causing some issues. This is a, a picture that I have of the eye and the retina itself. And on the left, you'll notice that the macula is the area where the highest concentration of your cones and rods are, the retinal cells that actually do the seeing for your eyes. Over on the right, you have all these pictures of various problems on the retina that have led to swelling, blistering, holes, rips, tears, bleeds, and things like that that cause a wrinkling of your retina. So once it starts to get wrinkled, it's like the film in your camera that's just getting wrinkled and that leads to the distortions that we were talking about. Finally, eye strain. And this is a big catch-all. There's so many things that can cause eye strain. You need to have the right glasses, first of all, with the right prescription for the right distance that you're working at to help alleviate eye strain. You need to have the proper lighting around and behind you and on the screen. An anti-reflection coating on your glasses can help a lot. And just having the right posture when you were working at the computer can make a big difference. Because you know most of us are doing hours and hours a day. Modern uh, students and office workers are doing eight to 12 hours a day on a computer. It's tough. So all these things with the special blue light filters that we have on your glasses can help cut some of those uh, annoying blue wavelengths that cause glare and damage the retina on the back of your eye. Also things like artificial tears, which we'll talk about in a few minutes and blinking enough, you need to blink more. People tend to stare when they're looking at the computers, controlling the heating and air conditioning around you because that can all lead to trouble too. Some folks will come in with newly acquired flashers and floaters. Most floaters that people see are normal and they're due to the little um, accumulations of the fibrils that make up the jello within your eye. The contents of your eye is a big jello ball called the vitreous. And when the little fibers in the vitreous start to condense on themselves, they cause shadows on the back of your eye. And those shadows are what appear in that picture on the left with the, all those little squiggly lines up against the sky. Those are the floaters that are normal that we all gain throughout our life. Typically, if you have 10 or less floaters at any given time, that's probably pretty normal. However, if you have flashing lights associated with it or a lot of floaters, hundreds or thousands, that could be a retinal detachment. Again, come in, let me take a look or go to a retina specialist, but uh, get those checked out to make sure that they're not part of a retinal detachment. 
one out of 10,000 people has a retinal detachment. It's not that common. However, virtually everybody has something called a vitreous detachment. And that occurs when the baggie, as is illustrated in that picture there, pulls away from the back of your eye and there's a very firm attachment right on the optic nerve. The picture on your left is one I took several years ago of a perfectly formed, it's called a Weiss ring. And it's the attachment of that bag that has pulled away from the optic nerve. It's free floating about three millimeters in front of the optic nerve. And I just happened to be able to get a perfect picture of it before it broke up into various pieces. So that's a, it's a unique picture that way, but it shows you how that baggie can rip away from the back of your eye and cause a good size floater. Again, these are normal, expected. By age 65, 65% 65 of people have one of these. By age 80, virtually everybody has one. We can check those out, make sure that they're normal and not leading to a tear of the retina. And then dry eye. This is one of the more common reasons people come into the office. On the left, there's a photo of a very smooth tear film over the front of the eye. Now that picture happens to be one that has a hard contact lens on, but a normal cornea would look just the same. Smooth, even tear film over the cornea. On the right, you'll notice a lot of little white or green spots there, those are desiccated or dried dead skin cells on the front of your eye. So you're, the front of your eye is just like your hands, it can get chapped. And when your tear film is not good, if it breaks up prematurely, it leads to those kinds of dry spots. This person may be sleeping with their eyes slightly open and that's causing that horizontal band across the bottom there, or they could have a polluted tear film just above their eyelid, the lower eyelid there, you can see all that pooling of tears. And if it's polluted, it's gonna kill all those skin cells over a period of time and lead to that desiccated, dry, very irritated eye. If it gets worse, it can start to look like the picture on the left. And there you have a massively irritated, dry eye. And you'll notice the extent of the dead, dry skin cells is much greater. And it impinges right in the center of the eye where you see. And so your vision starts to get real blurry and glary. And there's some mucus strands that are loose in the tear film. And you can see those dark areas in the photo. And those are areas where the tear film has literally broken up and it's exposing the eye directly to the air and that leads to all the dead skin cells. On the right is a little map, you might say, of your tear film. The cornea is the pink layer there that's projected out from the eye. And next to the cornea is your mucus layer that holds the tear to your eye. And then you have a water layer out in front of that. And finally, right, right up front is your lipid or oil layer. And that's what keeps the tears from evaporating. So it's a fine balance of those three things that keep your tears healthy, keep your eye healthy, and help to keep your vision really sharp. How do we take care of dry eye problems? Number one, well, we might use some artificial tears. Preservative-free ones are probably the best. <clears throat> On the upper right, there is some omega-3 fish oil capsules. Those are taken by mouth. You don't put them in your eyes, they're taken by mouth. They help to decrease inflammation of your eyelids and help produce better quality tears. A poor man's version of the omega-3 fish oil is just taking a tablespoon or a teaspoon of olive oil every day, and that can do the same thing. And then we've got a brooder mass down at the bottom. You put that in the microwave for 30 seconds or a minute, wrap a wet rag around it, lay it across your eyes for 10 minutes, and that helps to really rejuvenate your oil glands of your lower lids and upper lids so that your tear quality is better and your lids stay functioning well into your 80s, 90s, and even 100s. If those glands do pass away and die off atrophy, then you're in big tr trouble in your senior years because your tears just aren't gonna hold up. So this is something that everybody can benefit from, even at an early age, especially if you're a computer jockey 
you know, 12 hours a day or something. Okay, well, what types of problems do I find when I'm looking for people's uh, issues with the annual eye exam? Over on the right is a Snellen eye chart. That's kind of ubiquitous in every eye doctor's office. And on the far left, you see an eye doctor using a phoropter to help measure someone's prescription for their best vision. I'm gonna take a look at your, the front of your eyes with a microscope. I'm gonna take a look at the back of your eyes with a number of different lights to check the retina, the blood vessels, and the optic nerve. You know, the back of the eye is one of the unique places in your body where you can directly observe arterioles and venules to get a general sense of somebody's vascular system throughout their whole body. And so we can take a good look back there and see what's going on and sometimes find problems that you're just not aware of. Diabetes, high blood pressure, vasculitis, lots of different things. And then at the bottom, I have a color wheel to show that there's certainly other tests that we're gonna do for your color vision, your stereo vision, those types of things. We'll go over that in a few minutes here. Coming in for glasses is usually a big part of the annual eye exam. And what I've got here is an illustration of what nearsightedness is. When somebody has trouble seeing far away without glasses, they need lenses like I've displayed here that help to push the image back further so it's focused right on the retina where it's supposed to be, and voila, it takes care of the nearsightedness. Farsightedness is just the opposite. The image that you're looking at is focused behind the eye, so we have to pull it forward with lenses that are shaped just like those under the arrows. And finally, you can also have astigmatism with either of those two. You can have astigmatism by itself or with farsightedness or with nearsightedness. And astigmatism is caused by the front of your eye. If you'll take a look at my, my little image up in the upper right hand corner of my picture, this is a, like a basketball surface for a normal eye. And a person that has astigmatism has the shape of an eye that's more like a football, like that. And that causes the light to not focus as a point anywhere. And so what happens with astigmatism is instead of having a point focus, you end up having a focus that's in the shape of this piece of paper that I've made into a model. This is called a conoid of sturm. And this is what is created by an astigmatic surface. This is what astigmatism is really all about, is this crazy shape. So we determine with the use of a number of tools and your help, of course, it's always a team effort going to the eye doctor. And we determine how much astigmatism you have and the axis or angle of that astigmatism. And that helps to get you to see a lot sharper. I always call astigmatism the icing on the cake. When, we, when I get that right for somebody, they really appreciate it because that's what helps them really get their extra punch in their vision. So astigmatism blurs you at all distances, not just close or near. It's caused by an irregular or football-shaped cornea, and it can create those ghost images or overlapping double images that I was talking about earlier. And then if you're over age 40, you get another little birthday gift when you blow out your candle. <laughs> Sometimes a little earlier than 40, but 40 is kind of the magic number. And I'll explain why in a minute. You'll know just why 40 is the magic number there. So at 40, presbyopia takes over and it's not a disease. And it happens to everybody, no matter whether you're farsighted, nearsighted, or have perfect eyes. At age 40, the lens inside of your eye starts to become so hard that it just doesn't change shape to focus like it used to. And you can't pull your focus in up close to read. So that's when people start pushing things out further. So it's caused by the hardening of the lens in your eye with age. There's no eye drops, diet, or exercise that can slow that down at this point. However, within 50 years, we will have drugs and drops that will reduce that to a non-problem. And people will not need bifocals. That's my prediction. They're working on it now, and it's not that far off. 
So this is a little graph that I made to show you how and why age 40 is such an important number. On the far left of the graph is your amount of focusing or the ability of you to focus. Up at the top at 14, that's 14 diopters of focusing power that you have when you're a young kid. And whether you're far-sighted or near-sighted, it doesn't matter. That ability to focus goes down in a very predictable way as you age. So we need six diopters of focusing power to be able to do all of our comfortable work up close and, and do all the things that we need to do. And guess what? Right at age 40, according to that graph, we have reached the six number diopter uh, area and we start to appreciate that we need help up close. Not only that, but right after 40, the graph takes a serious drop, even steeper. And so between 40 and 50, everybody comes in saying, look, I can't do my close work anymore. I need special glasses. I need bifocals. And that's what introduces folks to the world of bifocals and special glasses. Now, you can think of it another way then. Before age 40, we're losing our ability to adjust our focus. But after age 40, we're losing our ability to focus. We just can't, it's not a matter of adjusting it. We just can't do it as well at all. By the time you're 50, you know, virtually everybody needs bifocals. So we do have some solutions to these focusing problems. And on the upper left there, you see one of the early Ben Franklin type bifocals. Yes, he did indeed invent bifocals. I'm told that uh, that happened when he was in France and he was looking at his food and he was trying to look across these long tables where everybody was dining with him and he wanted to have something where he could see both his food and the people at the table. That's what inspired him to make his first bifocals. We also have multifocals without lines. And if you look further to the right, you'll notice I have pictures of uh, some children there, you know, you don't have to be 40 years old to have focusing problems. And so, especially with all the close work that young kids are doing, they're holding things too close, they're spending too much time on things, without the proper glasses to help uh, minimize strain and stress. And by the way, that strain and stress doesn't make your eyes stronger. It wears them out and tugs them into a new shape, and it makes you nearsighted, and you lose your best distance vision. So we wanna prevent all that with the proper glasses, and eye exercises, and way down on the left over there, you'll see I've written the 20-20-20 rule. But what is that? The 20-20-20 rule is something that's, it's a very good idea for anybody who works on a computer for much of their day. Every 20 minutes, you stand up, push yourself away from the computer, you stand up, look at least 20 feet away for 20 seconds. Every 20 minutes, 20 feet away for 20 seconds. And that can help to relax your eyes so that they don't overstrain and start to become permanently nearsighted. Okay. We also are gonna test for eye alignment. And those three photos at the bottom illustrate somebody who's got an outturned eye and a young child who has a crossed eye and then a child on the right that has an outturned and hyper eye. Those are all things that can lead to double vision. But if you're born with something like that, you usually don't have double vision. Your brain just suppresses the vision from that eye and you don't notice double vision. The test that I have pictured there with the uh, glasses and the little booklet is called a stereopsis test. And that's something I do on all my patients. It helps to measure how well does your brain use both eyes at the same time? And that's a skill that's developed before age two. And it requires that both eyes were pointing perfectly at age two and they were both seeing clearly. And your brain says, I'm building a room that's gonna handle this for stereo vision. So when I'm doing that test, it tells me a lot about your vision system. And it's one of my favorites to do. And, um, you can expect to have that done if you come in to have your eyes checked at Gavin Herbert.
There's also eye movements that we look for, two types, saccades, which are eye jumping movements. That's your eyes jumping from one target to another in a quick jump back or forth. And then there's pursuits. Pursuits are eye movements that are following a single moving target, a continually moving target. Those two systems are different. They're controlled by different uh, nerve paths in the brain. And they're both important for getting around and reading and sports and all the things that we do in life. This uh, picture illustrates how saccades work. So if you were looking at this uh, picture of Queen Nefertiti, you might think, well, I just look at it and I see the whole thing. No, you don't. In actuality, your eye has to make hundreds of little jumps to appreciate all the detail in that uh, sculpture. And that's the map of all those jumps that your eye takes as it's jumping around collecting information. When you look up to the right over there at that picture of the girl's face, you don't just see the girl's face all at once. You have to jump around and collect all that information in about 40 different jumps to picture her together and get that fused image. And at the bottom, I was just using this to illustrate how important it is to have these accurate eye jumps or saccades for reading. So these are important tests that I work with on little kids to make sure that they don't have any deficits in that that would hold them back in school. Those are saccades or jumping eye movements. Pursuits are following things like an airplane follow, flying in the sky or a ball bouncing down the street or a ball coming at you if you're in the outfield, whatever. So those are two different kinds of eye movements that we uh, follow and check on and make sure that if you have problems with them, we can do something about it. Then there's the world of color vision. So for color vision, we usually use tests like is illustrated up on the right there. And as you can see, there's a huge spectrum of what we call electromagnetic radiation. All of this electromagnetic radiation is flying through the atmosphere constantly, everything from radio waves, microwaves. And then there's a very small segment of light that we can see. We call it visible light. And then on the other side, there's ultraviolet light all the way out to gamma rays and X-rays and things. So that's the light that we test for in our color vision. Not everybody has good color vision. And as you're gonna find out tonight, not all people are the same. So there's normal color vision in the upper left. Green, red blindness is on the right. 8% of men see what you see on the, on the right side over there. 8% of, of the male population, all nationalities, all ethnicities. Then in the lower left, there's a blue yellow defect. So those are what color vision defects see in their world. They don't get all the color that the rest of us get. And we have glasses that we, that we sell. And what they do is they take away certain wavelengths of what you're looking at to help to make the differences between the three primary colors, red, green, and blue. Now, most of us have three color cones that determine our color vision. But the, the people with color defects, the 8% of men are short of one or short of two, and that's why they have a color defect. And as a joke, I put this up here. Some women probably have a much more expanded list of names that they could call colors. And guys, it's just kind of, okay, red, purple, or green, that kind of thing. But is there any element of truth in this that can tell us something about what's really going on with modern technology and humanity. As a matter of fact, there is. So let's explore this page. You can see down in the lower left there, that's what a dog's view of the world is like. That's their color vision. Up above it is a human view. And when I go over to the right in the middle there, there's the trichromatic, that's a standard human color vision. Just below that is the red green color defect people at the very bottom is the blue yellow color defect people and 
what I wanted to illustrate here is that there's a newly found small subset of women only who have a fourth color cone. They don't have three like the rest of us. They have four. I call them a, wizen, a women's version of the X-Men from that uh, TV series. Um, so they have four color cones and they're hard to determine who they are. But our Dr. Jameson here at UCI is one of the people who's studying them. And they actually have more color vision than the rest of us. So, you know, even when you thought you had the world fully documented with color, guess what? There's just other things going on that uh, make it a little bit more confusing and complicated and wonderfully beautiful than we thought. So sunglasses, we've got things for, uh, we've got all kinds of tints, people, need and appreciate different kinds of tints. Gray keeps all color relationships the same. Brown is the best color to pre prevent macular degeneration in the back of your eyes. It helps to protect by filtering out the intense blue wavelengths that are the most damaging to the back of your eye. Some people like green because it softens things a little bit. Yellow blue blockers are the latest craze for people working on computers because they help to cut out the harmful blue waves that damage the back of the eye and cause a lot of glare. And then we've got rose tinted glasses for people who like enhanced vision. And then I, I guess blue tinted lenses are just for rock stars. That's kind of what I could figure out. So we've got transition lenses and we've, we used to have just gray and green and brown, but now we've got all kinds of colors. And these are lenses that change when you go outdoors. So we have all those available too. There's anti-reflection coatings and special materials that are ultra thin, ultra lightweight, built in UV protection, all kinds of great things that we can add to your glasses. And while I'm here, I'm just gonna show you briefly, we've got systems where you can have your prescription on your glasses and you can have a sunglass tint and you just magnet sticks it on like that or you can turn your regular glasses into computer glasses with a, an attachment that gives you the reading power you need for the computer looking straight ahead in a big area and it has built-in uv and blue light protection as well so we've got all kinds of great tricks that can make your life a little bit easier and more protective of your vision. Workplace and safety glasses, sports goggles, contact lenses, you know, you tell me what your hobbies are, let's try and make something that really helps you to see, do, and be your best. Getting back to that adage I said very early on in the talk. Contact lenses, I could give a whole talk on this for, for an hour and a half. But we've got great contact lenses now, soft ones with astigmatism, multifocals, even astigmatism correcting multifocals. We've got hard contacts. We've got hybrids that are hard in the center to give you precise sharp vision and soft on the outside for comfort. And then we've got sclerals for people with real dry eye or that have eye diseases and scars on their corneas and they just can't see well with, with regular soft contacts. They need a big scleral for that. We have a low vision department at UCI that takes care of those folks who cannot see 2040. So if your vision drops or dips below 2040, then you have a hard time because you can't pass your driver's test. You can't read standard print in a magazine or newspaper, and you need some help with magnifiers and special devices. We've got all that for you. So you don't have to live without help. Come and let us help you out. Finally, even though Halloween is past, let's talk about this little critter. These two critters, I should say. These are little arthropods, believe it or not, and they're called demodex. They live on virtually everybody. And there's two types, demodex follicularum that live in your eyelash follicles, down at the base of your eyelashes. 
And then there's Demodex brevis that lives in the oil glands of your skin. Now, these little critters are so small that I cannot see them with my regular microscope. You'd need an electron microscope to see them. But they crawl out of your eyelash follicles at night. I told you Halloween's past, but this is about the creepiest thing you're going to hear all week. These little guys crawl out of your eyelash follicles at night. And they cause trouble all over your skin and waste products and things like that. And then they, when the light comes on in the morning, they go back down and live in your uh, eyelash follicles. Well, that's what they look like, highly magnified with an electron microscope. And that you can see on the eyelashes, they produce all kinds of junky stuff that builds up there, flaky things. And they can cause eyelid inflammation on the, your lower eyelids and your eyelashes can start to fall out. So they're nasty little guys, but like I say, they're practic they're basically ubiquitous. You know, everybody has these darn things living on them, but when they get out of control, then they cause a lot of trouble. We can help to get rid of them with hygiene and keeping your lids and lashes clean. And also we can get rid of them with one of these commercial products. Uh, one of the things that we sell at our office is the Oasis and OcuScrub products along with Clearadex. And those are basically a tea tree oil component that helps to kill off these little guys so that they don't get out of control. So that's called Demodex. And it's something that I look for problems on people and help to clear them up. Certainly we wanna clear up problems like that before you have any surgery on your eyes. Or if you're having contact lens problems, we gotta make sure we get rid of those guys you know, pronto. Now, we're, we've got about 15 minutes left. I'm gonna go over one more thing and that's some high technology uh, talk about why progressive lenses are different. They're not all the same. So, you know, the need for a progressive goes back to Ben Franklin when he sat at that table in France and wanted to see his food and he wants to see far away. Well, a progressive lens does more than that. It gives you far, intermediate and near all in the same lens. And if you look to the right, you'll notice that red cross on that lens, that red cross indicates that that's the optical center of a lens. All lenses have a singular optical center. And that particular point, once you leave it and move down to get your intermediate or near vision, you're gonna gain distortions and aberrations by nature of the way optics works. So an aberration degrades the image of what you're looking at. On the far left, you see those pinpoint dots. That's what should be seen. And aberrations cause things to have a little ghost image or double vision, kind of a blurry mess. And so we want to get rid of that. Well, there's more than one aberration. There's a lot of them. And they're all created by different things, but they have to do with the way light bends through uh, lenses and causes blurry images. So what aberrations do basically is take something like on the right, a high resolution image, and they cause it to be low resolution. And we've gotten to the point where we can get past that. Just recently, we've had some new technologies. Now, I, I created this uh, image here to help explain what a progressive lens does. Now, the curved line that I have drawn there is showing how the curve on the front surfaces of the lens starts to get steeper, 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 steeper. And as it gets down to the bottom of the trunk, it really gets steep. Well, keep that in mind when we look at this. I've got what looks like an elephant trunk on the left. And at the very top, you have flatter curves that make up the surface of that trunk. And as you go down towards the bottom into the green, the curves are gonna get tighter and, and uh, more intense. And those tighter curves are what create the stronger power for the glasses at the bottom of your progressive lens. On the right, you'll notice the big pink area at the top. That's your distance. 
you come down through the channel into the yellow and the green, and then finally into the blue. But all those areas on the sides are distortions, and they're filled with aberrations and cause all kinds of trouble. A standard lens, when you look down and it's got different bifocal powers in it, it's gonna create more distortions. The picture up on the right there that I have of the little red square, you'll notice that it gets pulled when you're looking down in the lens, it gets pulled into a funny shape that's outlined by the black. And when you have one of those from one eye on the left and the other one on the right in the red, you put those together and it creates a lot of trouble for seeing. It's something we call swim. Well, those kinds of distortions and swim make it tough to go up and down stairs when you're wearing a progressive lens that's a standard progressive lens. And these different distortions are now something that we can eliminate or virtually eliminate with new designs. So we've, we've got these brilliant eye designers who work at these labs and they've re-engineered the way lens surfaces are made so that if you take a big lens like that one on the lower left and you break it up into small little tiny micro areas and each one of those is surfaced individually instead of a big smooth surface, no. Each one of those is specifically surfaced on the inside to create just the right power and on the outside to reduce the aberrations and they're coordinated as a group next to each other so that one is paying attention to the one next to it, to the next to that, and it all blends into a beautiful seamless way of creating a lens. And that helps to get rid of these distortions illustrated in the red squares and gives you what you see in the right. This is what modern high technology progressives do for each lens left and right. Now, when you put the lenses together for people, then you get a whole nother problem. And that's that when you're looking to the left and the right within the bottom part of your glasses, you can get blurry images in one eye that don't match with the other. And that causes a very narrow restricted area to stay in. So this new synchron, I call it, they've, they've dubbed this the synchronized system. It helps to coordinate when they manufacture the glasses so that your left eye and your right eye are coordinated as a team. It's not just an individual left and an individual right. No, these lenses are coordinated as a team so that when you look to the left and look to the right, you have a broader, more expansive field of view. And it is wonderful technology. It wasn't around uh, 15, 20 years ago. This is, this is relatively new stuff. Progressive lenses have been in existence since 1907. And they were first patented, I believe, in 1915. Or, uh, and then uh, they, they got um, a lot of push in the 50s. But they've been around for a long time. And it's just been in the past 15 years or so that we have these beautiful progressive lenses that are much better than the old ones. Now, having said all that, this is what we're finally looking for, is high definition, resolution, sharp, clear images throughout the lenses. And so you don't have to be afraid to come into your eye exam. We want you to come excited. We want you to come willing to learn, expecting to learn, and trying to solve problems. It's a team effort. That, so I ask you to make an appointment, come in, get your eyes checked, and just leave Toto at home. So now if there's some questions, let's see if Dana can tell me what the questions are and I'll see if I can answer any of them. We've got uh, about seven minutes or so before eight o'clock. That's great information, Dr. Legler. Thank you so much. Um, I don't see any questions in the chat, but if you would like to um, unmute yourself and ask Dr. Legler a question, you can raise your hand and we can let you um, speak to Dr. Legler. Any questions? Well, I've been looking at Angelica's face here um, with her beautiful pigtails most of the evening as she's been on the screen here. Angelica, do you have any questions at all? I know you were paying attention. 
We have several Angelicas because we sent a link that actually okay. had uh, just, Angelica's a... name. So we've got a lot of Angelicas attending this okay, evening. Okay, well, this one was Angelica Arias. She's she was she was kind of front and center on my screen for most of the talk. There we Do you go. have any questions? Dr. Okay. Ligler, I have a question for you. Sure. How often should someone get a eye exam? We recommend yearly eye exams. Some people can get by every two, but yearly eye exams are what insurance companies help pay for. And that's kind of the, uh, the standard for the industry, for the medical industries, yearly eye exams. Got it, thank you. We have a question from Sohail, um, thanking you for a great presentation and wondering if not wearing his glasses will um, cause his vision to uh, worsen at a higher rate. That question would have to be answered specifically if I knew his prescription and what his tasks were. It very well may be, Sohil, that you're better off taking your glasses off when you're doing close work and things and you're using them only for distance. So that's a very specific question that I could only answer knowing what your prescription would be and your tasks. Uh, somebody else wants to know if you could discuss uh, contacts for kids that can sleep in overnight to help improve vision. Those are called orthokeratology contacts. And they're hard contacts made out of hard plastic. And they work along the same lines as braces on teeth. So children or young adults typically wear them overnight. They're very popular in China and Asia. We don't fit them here at uh, Gavin Herbert Eye Institute simply because they're prone to causing serious eye infections. And we've had a number of young people who have had to have corneal transplants due to those. Having said that, I have great friends who I respect in the opti optometric community that fit them very successfully and they do uh, an outstanding job with them but we don't fit them here at UCI. Uh, some Lily asks where you find glasses with clip-on blue light and sunglasses. We sell uh, we, them, don't we? We do have them at our office. We have a demonstrator for you there. Uh, they're called the, it's called the chemistry system. So you can take your glasses, old frame or new frame. They put little magnets right in the front and you can take an attachment and just clip it right on and it turns your glasses into computer glasses with the blue light protection, or you can get any color tint you want on your sunglasses, mirrored or not, and they can clip right on too. It's a great system for travelers and people who uh, wanna have one pair of glasses to do everything, virtually everything. Dr. Liebler, I have another question for you. Sure. Do you recommend children um, have sunglasses on. Yes. On the belt side. Yes. Yes. For you know a lot of silly reasons, we've taken away the ability for kids to wear sunglasses at school in the playground when they're really young, or hats because they were associated with gangs and they didn't want to have kids wearing hats. Well, in Australia, it's just the opposite. It's mandatory that you wear sunglasses and mandatory that you wear hats when you're outdoors when you're a little kid. So they do that at school. But they, uh, uh, we get roughly 75 to 80% of all of our light input into our eyes throughout our whole life before we're 18 years old. So having protection when you're a kid is a great idea. When I'm examining people, I can tell whether they grew up in Minnesota or whether they grew up in Southern California when they're about 40 years old by telling, I can see how much cataract they have developed. And when you grow up way up north and there's not that much sun, you just don't develop cataracts at quite the same rate. You don't have as much uh, damage to the front of your eye as well, desiccation and dryness. So yeah, wearing sunglasses is a great idea for kids. Get them started early. Uh, John asks if there's a significant difference between lenses made of glass and plastics. Okay, well, let's, let's answer John's questions. First, there's there's basically two materials that you can make glasses out of. Glass, or as John pointed out, plastics. 
we hardly do glass anymore, even though it's optically one of the purest materials to make lenses out of, because it's so heavy. And when it breaks, it breaks into tiny shards that can damage your eye. So it's the least safe of all the materials. Now within the plastics, we have numerous types of plastics and they all have their own advantages and disadvantages, but plastics are what we make 99.9% .9 of glasses out of. And we have lots of different plastics at different price ranges that do different things. Great. Um, somebody asked about getting uh, kids glasses with UV protection. And of course we know that's possible and the right thing to do, isn't it? You bet. Everybody's got that message taken home. Yeah. Um, Marianne asks how she manages uh, years of incremental changes in her glasses. Uh, well, we'd have to find out how much those incremental changes are and which direction they're going. And that's, that gets into that area where my experience tells you whether it's normal and age related or if it's a sign of something serious going on. Um, as Hi, Dr. Liedler, this is Marianne, and I love eyewear, and I have lots of wonderful frames, and so I bring them to you, and you test my eyes, and you create um, prescriptions for them, but I probably have 10 years of, like, different frames, slightly different prescriptions. Like, what would be helpful? Should I be tracking each pair of lenses and What's in there? Like, how can I know when a pair of glasses is needs to be sunset or needs to be changed? That's a really good question, Marianne. So here's, here's my general answer for that. If you can put them on and function comfortably and you don't feel like you're squinting and hurting and you put a different pair on and it's so much better, well, then that pair needs to be retired. But if you can put them on and comfortably get around and do things, keep them the way they are. Don't spend money replacing those. Just keep them the way they are. Eventually you may have changes that require you to put them off to pasture, but if you can comfortably wear them, do so. Thank you. Um, somebody asked if it's better for teenagers to wear contacts as opposed to glasses. It, it certainly is better for, for teenagers to wear contacts for certain uh, hobbies and sports and things like that. I mean, they're the cat's meow for people who are in theater and want to be able to do plays and shows without glasses on or for water sports and want to be able to see or for any sport that requires a, you know, a helmet or something like that, volleyball. So sports is a big thrust for, for kids that would otherwise need thick glasses to be able to function and do properly. They, uh, they're much safer than wearing glasses in a lot of ways. The vision's a lot sharper, uh, provided that they're properly handled and cared for. But yeah, we do a lot of that for, uh, for kids. We have another question asking about diagnosing cataracts and if doctors generally share the results of previous eye exams with you. Yes, they, they do, they can, but usually we don't need to know how much cataract you had in the past, what's really important is how much do you have right now? So when I see somebody, I talk to them about their deficits of their vision and whether I can attribute it or blame it on cataracts. And if I can, I let them know whether their cataracts are trace, mild, moderate, or severe. And I tell them at what level insurance companies typically start to pay for cataract surgery. And I always offer them to go to see one of our brilliant cataract surgeons if they're interested. And they can get to know them and get started in the process of cataract surgery. Cataract surgery in, usually involves one eye getting done and a week later you get the other eye done. And it takes about three weeks after that second eye for everything to heal up and whatnot. So there's a lot of eye doctor visits and a lot of time, and you have to pick the right season of the year to do it that's convenient for you. So I usually have people kind of planning this thing out one or two years in advance sometimes. But when they get bad, and they can get bad very quickly, 
literally overnight sometimes, then uh, you need to move promptly and you know and get seen and we can we can get you in at uh, Gavin Herbert very easily for that. So we're just past eight. There are two more questions in the chat, Dr. Legler, if you have another minute or two. Sure, I'll, I'll stay. Yeah, um, as long as you need. Uh, one person asked if it's possible that progressive lenses don't work for everyone. They don't work for everyone. There's a small percentage of people that they just don't work for, even though the highest technologies are available. We sometimes joke about them as being what we call engineering personalities. They're people who look for problems in the glasses and they always find them. They prefer a straight line bifocal that's far away and drop over the line and close up. And it's just an A or B question to answer. And they, they just drive themselves crazy with progressives because they're always looking in the wrong places and searching out the bad points instead of finding the best spot and making the most of it and using it and accepting it. So there are personality types that just don't do well with progressives. Another type of person that doesn't is somebody who has eyes that jitter around a lot. If their eyes are nervous and jittering a lot, they just don't do well with a progressive. Great. Somebody else asked about their that they have astigmatism and dry eyes and they had cataract and retina surgeries on the left eye. Is it better to wear glasses or contacts, soft or hard? Well, that would be a, that would be a question I could only answer after examining the person and seeing how good the vision we could get with glasses would be and then finding out if their cornea is normally shaped and could accept a soft lens or if it's erratic and bumpy like my knuckles with scars all over it, they might have to have a hard contact for that. So yeah, that would be a very, very specific uh, test set that we'd have to do for that person. Great, and maybe one last question. Um, and that is, is there a number of hours, uh, maximum hours that one should wear contacts each day? Uh, typically, I would say 12 to 14 hours would be a, you know, a good day. We do have lenses that are approved for sleeping in. And on some patients, we have them sleep in them on purpose because they have such severe dry eye. But normally, that's not the case. So, you know, 10 to 14 hours is, is a good long day. That's, that wraps up the questions in the chat. Um, if there's anybody else who would like to ask a quick question of Dr. Legler before we let him go for this evening. Mm. Looks what like... Was it? Go ahead. I'm sorry, Dr. Legler. It was a joy uh, working with you all tonight. I hope you, you felt a little bit inspired. And, uh, you know, I, I have a great passion for this vision business. To me, uh, it started when I was in high school and I took a photography class and we had to learn about light. And I found it to be absolutely fascinating what light was all about, what it does. And I want you to bring your questions when you go to your next eye exam, wherever it is. You bring your questions and have them answered and you'll get as excited about all this stuff as I am. That's great. Well, you have lots of uh, compliments in the chat, Dr. Legler, if you wanna take a quick look before they disappear. But thank you so much. It was wonderful. And again, we've recorded this lecture and once it's edited, we'll be sending it out to everybody who registered and it will be available on our website. So um, do take a look at the uh, ophthalmology.uci.edu events page to see our upcoming 2023 lecture series with nine great lectures. We hope you'll join us um, and thank you very much. Thank you, Dana. You and your team do a great job putting this all together. I, I'm very impressed. It's our pleasure, Dr. Legler. Thank you so much.